Well, if you've been around Chapel Street for any length of time, and you know that um, I have always enjoyed sports. I tell lots of stories about sports. You know that I enjoy sports. I grew up playing sports in a family uh, that did all kinds of things. I played baseball and basketball and football and tennis and soccer, ping pong, uh, even archery. I went to camp one time and fell in love with archery. My parents bought me a little target, had a bow and arrow for one summer. That's what I did out in our yard. Uh, but the one sport my whole life that I've never, never enjoyed is wrestling. <laughs> wrestling. Now, Pastor Jeff was a wrestler. You know that, don't you? He was a really good wrestler, like an all-American wrestler in college. I mean, think about that. It's terrifying. My dad would wrestle around with us as boys when we were little, and I wrestled with my boys when they were small. But real wrestling, you know, no thanks. Two reasons. First, I was bad at it. I remember um, we had to learn wrestling in seventh grade gym class. Anybody have good memories about seventh grade gym class? <laughs> Just awful. But I was pretty much the worst wrestler in seventh grade gym class. I could do most everything else in gym, but wrestling, not good. Way too much grabbing and touching and stuff like that. But the biggest reason... Um, I didn't like wrestling, was that wrestling hurts. It just hurts. Real wrestlers are like trying to tear limbs off your body. So, well, fast forward to college, uh, years after seventh grade gym class. One night, a bunch of us were just goofing around, and a hallmate, uh, a friend of mine named Kenny, who I happened to know had been a wrestler in high school years before, uh, challenged me this one night, starts pushing me, in, and he wants to wrestle. And I didn't really want to wrestle Kenny. Because I know I'm not good at wrestling, but he wanted to wrestle, and there's all the guys around. They start egging me on, and, and all that one thing leads to another, and I, I cave into peer pressure. And I'm, starting th I'm thinking, well, you know, I'm bigger and stronger now. You know, I'm a college athlete. I play basketball. Maybe I'll be better at wrestling. And no, I wasn't better at wrestling. Within like five minutes, he had me bent into like a human pretzel shape. And when he was done, I had like carpet burns. All over my body, knees, back, elbows, because he just like wiped, me, wiped the floor up with me. But I learned something. I learned never wrestle with a wrestler. <laughs> never wrestle with someone who knows what they're doing because you're going to lose and it's probably going to hurt. Well, our theme this fall has been with Jesus. And we just finished a, a sort of a mini-series that involved talking about stories where Jesus was at the table with someone, eating with Jesus. We're going to finish our service today by coming to the table of the Lord. And in these stories we've looked at so far, stories of being with Jesus at the table, we saw that Jesus wants to be in a, in a table relationship with us. That's a relationship of friendship and intimacy, a relationship marked by grace and transformation. Now today we're going to shift gears just a bit, begin a little mini-series called Wrestling with Jesus. Now, we chose the, the word wrestling because as you read the New Testament, Jesus quite often did and said things that made people uncomfortable, very uncomfortable at times, because he challenged their assumptions about God. He challenged people's assumptions about religion. He challenged their assumptions about marriage and relationships and money. He surprised people sometimes. He shocked people. He disturbed people people. Some listened, understood, and followed him. Others resented him, disagreed with him, rejected him. Some even hated him, but almost everyone wrestled with him. And the truth is, that's what he wanted. He wanted to wrestle with people, and he wants to wrestle with us because he wants to challenge us and wants to change us. And so today, our topic is wrestling with Jesus about the kingdom, about the kingdom of God. I'm going to start with two short passages. The first one uh, comes from Mark chapter 1. This is very early in Jesus' public ministry. In fact, it's among the very first things he said in terms of public ministry. Mark chapter 1. <clears throat> Mark writes, Now after John, that's John the Baptist, was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming, the gospel of God, and saying, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The next passage I want to read is a couple of years later, well into Jesus' ministry. In fact, toward the end of his ministry, he's being confronted by religious leaders who are challenging him, challenging his teaching. Luke chapter 17. 
Luke writes, being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. Nor will they say, look, here it is, or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. Now, before I jump into these two short texts, we need to know that Jesus talked more about the kingdom of God than any other single subject in his teaching that we have record of in the New Testament. In fact, almost everything Jesus says and does from sayings that we're very familiar with, do unto others as, they would, as, you, as you would have them do unto you, or love your neighbors as yourself, or miracles like restoring sight to the blind, or, or touching and cleansing the leprous man, all those things are ways of illustrating what the kingdom is and what it means to live as a servant of the king. So the first thing we see in these two short passages is that Jesus is saying the kingdom is not what you think. The kingdom of God is not what you think it is. Now, those of us living in 21st century North America don't think very often in terms of kingdoms and kings. We think in terms of democracies and governments. Uh, the notion of a kingdom and a king is a little bit foreign to us. I did a little research this week. Did you know that there are still kings in the world today who have absolute power over their kingdoms? By the way, there, there are something like 43 countries in the world today who have some form of, of monarchy. Most of them are constitutional monarchies where the king or queen are sort of like figureheads. But there are still five, about five, absolute monarchies in the world today where absolute power is vested in a single person. And I'm going to put three pictures on the screen to see if you can recognize these absolute power kings. First, uh, how about this guy? You recognize this guy? Anybody know who that is? I didn't think so because I didn't either. Okay. This, he is King Maswati III of Swaziland. He has been absolute ruler of Swaziland for 32 years since he was 18 years old. Uh, here's another one. Looks a little more familiar. That's King Solomon something, something, something of Saudi Arabia. Uh, and then I, I got one more. Recognize him? I didn't think you would either. This is the Sultan of Oman, who has ruled with absolute power for 48 years there. See, in our culture, we are much more familiar with kings like this. <laughs> Don't mean to make you hungry. But in the first century, the world was all about kings and kingdoms. So when Jesus uses the phrase, the kingdom of God, people immediately thought two things. First, they thought about the Roman emperor, Caesar Tiberius, who was the ruler of the Roman Empire at the time of Jesus, power over the entire Roman Empire, including Israel, who was being dominated by Rome at the time. And they thought about their God, Yahweh, Jehovah, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who spoke the universe into existence and is the sovereign ruler over all things. They thought about Psalm 93. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty and armed with strength. Indeed, the world is established firm and secure. Your throne was established long ago. You are from all eternity. So Jesus knew, his audience knew, and I think we know today that there are two kingdoms that exist simultaneously. There is the kingdom of this world, the kingdom of nations and rulers and politics, the kingdoms of culture and race and ethnicity, the kingdoms of entertainment and economics that exert powerful influence over our lives. And we are very aware at this moment in our culture of the power of that kingdom, the earthly kingdoms. But there is also the kingdom of God, where God is acknowledged as a sovereign ruler over all things, where he rules over the hearts and lives of those who voluntarily submit to his authority. And that kingdom is much, much harder to see. Two kingdoms. Two kingdoms that are often in direct conflict with each other. And this, by the way, is one of the ways to understand the entire storyline of the Bible from beginning to end. God is sovereign ruler who created human beings in his own image to share joyfully in his loving rule. But his creation, human beings rebelled against their creator and set out to be free from his authority and rule. And the result is a fallen kingdom of this world and all its brokenness, violence, 
and pain. Now, you don't have to be a social scientist or a theologian to look around and see that the kingdom of this world is horribly broken. You don't have to be a theologian to understand that the kingdom of God is very, very difficult to see in the midst of all this brokenness. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. Now, the story of the Bible is the clash of these kingdoms, how God carves out for himself a people to live in covenant relationship with himself under his authority and rule, and through that people to bring salvation into the world. Now, at the time of Jesus, when we read these passages, the people of Israel were intensely aware that they needed salvation. They longed for deliverance, but what they were thinking about was salvation from deliverance from Rome, from the power of Tiberius Caesar. They were looking for what they called the Messiah, the anointed one, one who would come and restore Israel to prominence. They thought of the Messiah as a great king in the mold of King David from the Old Testament, a deliverer who would lead them in a successful liberation to make Israel great again. In a sense, they had confused the two kingdoms. They were thinking to themselves, if we just had a great political and military leader, if we just had a king who could set us free from the oppressive power of the pagan and immoral government, then we could live happily ever after. That should sound vaguely familiar to you. Because sometimes we also confuse these two great kingdoms. We look to the kingdom of this world for that which can only be found in the kingdom of God. We're going to talk more about the kingdom and politics, Jesus and politics, in a few weeks. So it makes sense that Jesus begins his ministry right off the bat by pointing to a different kind of kingdom. Again, Mark says, Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now, we hear that today and we, we aren't particularly shocked by that because we're somewhat familiar with the story. It sounds like Jesus talking. It sounds like Bible talk. It doesn't shock us. But in that day and that time, would, that would have been profoundly disturbing to those hearing Jesus talk because he's saying that the kingdom of God is not about political freedom or economic prosperity. It's not about deliverance from the Romans and Israel becoming great again. It's about repentance. They'd be thinking, who? Who repent? Us? We're the people of God. Repentance and the gospel. It's a spiritual kingdom. It's about turning from sin. That's what repentance means. And trusting the grace and salvation of God that will ultimately be accomplished in and through Jesus himself. So, the kingdom of God is not what you think, is what Jesus is saying. He goes on to teach that the kingdom of God is not about castles and palaces and power. It begins small, almost imperceptibly. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus tells a series of short little parables. He says, he told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field, though it's the smallest of all seeds. Yet when it grows, it's the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds come and perch in its branches. Whenever I read that parable, I, I almost invariably think about the 124-year history of this church family. Planted as a seed in 1894 by 10 Swedish immigrants as the first Swedish Baptist Church of Geneva, I don't think those Swedes could have imagined it in their wildest dreams what that little seed they planted would become all these years later. It's a mustard seed that grows as the kingdom of God grows. Jesus also taught that the kingdom is to have pervasive influence. Same chapter, Matthew 13. Then he told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour. That's a lot of flour. I never noticed that before. Until it worked through the dough. Influence. A number of years ago... Um, when our name was still FBCG, I remember a friend of mine told me that, a, a friend in the church told me she was at a local restaurant uh, and overheard a conversation in the booth right behind her in the restaurant. She said, I wasn't trying to eavesdrop, but I couldn't help hear this conversation. 
and it was between two women that she did not know. And in the course of that conversation, one of them said, you know, I think I, I, think I need to find a church. And the other one said, well, I don't go to church, but you should try First Baptist of Geneva because that's where I would go if I went to church. <laughs> and I love that story because it's about, it's about influence. Jesus also taught that the kingdom is of surpassing value. Same chapter, Matthew 13. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. The kingdom is worth the investment of all that we have. So, the kingdom of God is where God rules. The good news is that God is building an eternal kingdom of righteousness and peace and invites us into his kingdom through faith. Jesus says it this way, repent and believe in the gospel. To repent is to turn around, to go in a new direction. To believe the gospel means to shift our allegiance from the kingdom of this world to the kingdom of God. And that's good news, he says. That's the first thing. Second thing we see here, Jesus says the king is not who you think he is. The king is not who you think he is. Pastor Jeff told me a story a few years ago. Uh, during a time when he was volunteering as a, um, a football coach at Batavia High School. Uh, my boys were going through the, 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 the program at that time. But Jeff had access and interactions with all these young men. And he had a conversation with a young guy who did not go to our church that went something like this. After a, it was a spiritual conversation, and at some point the young man said to him, well, yeah, I guess I could use a little God in my life. And then Jeff responded with great wisdom. Spur of the moment, he said, yeah, you probably do, but he's not small. He's not little. I love that conversation because he wanted that young man to know that whatever his idea of God was beforehand, whatever he thought of God was probably too small. That God was much larger and much closer than he could imagine. I think that's probably true for many of us. Luke chapter 17. Being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. Nor will they say, look, here it is or there. For behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. Now, here we also struggle to hear the outrage, the shock of this story. Because Jesus is saying not only is the kingdom not coming in the way you expect it to come, not only is the Messiah not coming to defeat Rome, not coming to restore Israel to economic and political greatness, but the kingdom of God is present right now in me in the midst of you. Jesus is saying he is the king. This had to be shocking. I mean, this was a carpenter from Nazareth. There was nothing kingly about him. But Jesus didn't come to be king in the way the people of the time wanted him to be king. Jesus himself said in Matthew 20, the son of man, title for the Messiah, did not come to be served. All kings want to be served, not this king. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So what kind of king is this? Jesus is not a king who dwells in ornate kingly palaces, surrounded by luxury. He's a king born in a stable, worked as a common carpenter, rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. Jesus is not a king who rules by military might, not by force or fear, rather a king who rules by serving and sacrifice. He's the king who went to the cross. Now think about that. The kings of this world, the sultans, the sheikhs, the prime ministers, the presidents, they don't go to the cross. The kings of this world send other people to the cross, right? Not this king. This king rules by giving up his position and power by going to the cross in our place. The kings of this world use position and power to intimidate and to, to uh, subjugate their subjects. They rule through terror and fear, but not this king. Jesus rules not by fear, but by love. He invites allegiance not through fear of judgment, but by the offer of grace. Jesus is a different kind of king. And Jesus is the king whose rule is made visible through this, the church. John Calvin said it's the task of the church to make the invisible kingdom visible. Around here, we like to say that Serve the World, our initiative to uh, support ministries locally and globally that are doing things that we can't do, but we support them financially. Many of you are generous towards Serve the World. We like to say that Serve the World exists to make the gospel tangible 
and visible. Sometimes I think we make the mistake of thinking about the kingdom of God as something that's out there somewhere, that it's that's out there maybe at the end of all things, uh, maybe we, we associate it with, with heaven, that someday, someday we're going to see the kingdom of God. But that's only partly true. We'll talk about that in a minute. Because Jesus taught that the kingdom is not just out there, it's right here, present now. Where? How? In and through the people and the community that is surrendered to the authority and rule of Christ the King. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. Thirdly, we see in, these, in the scriptures that the king is not finished yet. So the kingdom is not what you think. The king is not who you think he is. And the king is not yet finished. Now, most of you, I suspect, have at least some familiarity with the legend of Robin Hood. You know, um, bow and arrow, green tights, funny hat. You know, Robin Hood. Outlaw, robbed the rich, gave to the poor. This is a famous statue that's outside Nottingham Castle in England. Kind of a fierce-looking guy. But the interesting thing is, the legend of Robin Hood is, is mostly that, legend. It's, it's mostly mythology. We can't really, historians can't really anchor exactly when he lived and exactly what he did. But his legend grew. But his legend is connected to a legitimate historical figure. Richard I, King of England, also called Richard the Lionheart. That's a great nickname, don't you think? You know, there were other nicknames of, of kings of England. I was curious. I looked up other na- nicknames of kings of England. Did you know some of them? There was King Ethelred, the Unready. There was King Edward I, Longshanks. My favorite was Henry VIII, Old Copper Nose. I'd rather be the Lionheart. Right? Lionheart. Well, the story goes, while King Richard the Lionheart was off fighting the Crusades in the Middle East, his brother, John, tried to usurp his throne. John was an oppressive and corrupt leader, did all kinds of bad things. And Robin Hood, the legend says, believed that Richard the Lionheart, and not his evil brother, was the true king of England. So, his daring escapades, whatever they were, were him acting on behalf of the true king, who was not there at the time. He was doing what he thought the king would want him to do. And when King Richard finally came back to England, Robin Hood was rewarded, and John, the usurper of the throne, was banished. Now here's the analogy, as strange as it may seem. Jesus is the true king. Jesus came into the world announcing the arrival of the kingdom of God in himself. He healed the sick. He fed the hungry. He touched the lepers. He became the Lamb of God, the final sacrifice for the sins of the world. He rose again from the dead to defeat forever the power of sin and death. He then established the church and sent the Holy Spirit to empower us to be his witnesses. And then, the book of Acts says, he left. He ascended into heaven and returned to his throne, his eternal throne. So in a sense, we are like Robin Hood, not the green tights and not robbing the rich and giving to the poor, but waiting for the return of the true king, our king, and while we wait, doing what he wants us to do. But that's not the end of the story. The Bible says the true king isn't finished yet. Jesus promised to return. There's still a chapter to be written. Let me read from you for you. Just one passage from the great book of Revelation, Revelation 19. John the Apostle has a vision into heaven, and he writes this. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He's dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp, two-edged, sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, all that dramatic, apocalyptic language to say that Jesus promised to return. And when he returns as king, 
He'll put an end to all injustice, an end to sin, an end to suffering and evil. He will put an end to death itself and rule his eternal kingdom, the new heaven and new earth, with absolute authority. That's a promise. But we aren't there yet. We live in between. And we're waiting for the return of our king. So what do we do while we wait? We worship and we serve our king and we make his kingdom visible. How? There's so much that's broken in the world. So much that it often appears that the kingdom of God is just nowhere to be found. Don't you get just so tired over and over again in the newspapers and social media and television? Oh, the bad news just never ends. Where is the kingdom? Where do we see the mustard seed? Where do we see the yeast of influence? I think we know. When dozens of adults, high school students, and middle school students serve and care for children with special needs and their families in Buddy Break or Masterpiece, the kingdom's there. When a woman who had her teeth broken out of her mouth by a violent domestic abuser comes to Shepherd's Heart, and finds not only a new set of teeth, but hope. The kingdom is there. When 121 people are baptized at our stadium service as a symbol of new life and new identity in Christ, the kingdom is there. When 90 Chapel Streeters are running in the Chicago Marathon right now to raise almost $200,000 just so people they'll never meet until heaven can have fresh water in Africa, the kingdom is there. When women are rescued from the sex traffic industry through Naomi's house, there is the kingdom. When men find freedom and healing from sexual addiction through one of our compass small groups, the kingdom is there. When the Chapel Street We Care team makes 500 visits in a year to homebound senior adults just to let them know they're still loved, the kingdom is there. See, Jesus is king. And his kingdom is present wherever he rules. There's only one question that remains for me, for you. Only one question. Who is your king? Who is our king? Who is the authority, the ruler of your heart? Culture? Politics? Money? Yourself? There's no shortage of kings that want to rule. But Jesus wants to confront all those who would usurp his rightful place. He wants to wrestle with us because he wants to rule in our hearts. He wants to make his kingdom visible through us. But here's the thing. He does want to wrestle with us, with you, but he doesn't coerce you. He won't force you. But he does want to wrestle. And if you do wrestle with him, he always wins. Always. And that's good news. We're going to close our service at the Lord's table today, remembering the sacrifice of our King. And so prepare your hearts, bow with me as I lead us in prayer, and then we'll receive the Lord's table. Lord Jesus, we thank you today for your word, for being a King who does not seek to rule by fear and intimidation, but by sacrifice and grace. In a moment, we're going to hold in our hands again the bread and the cup. Remind us of the greatness of your love. Thank you for inviting us to share in your kingdom by faith. Teach us to increasingly make your kingdom visible through our imitation of your service and love. Thank you for being willing to wrestle with us and to work through us. In your name that we pray.